Let's get started. Thank you for joining us at Mechanics Institute for our online program. The Writer's Lunch is a casual and virtual brown bag lunch activity on the third Friday of each month. Look forward to craft discussion, informal presentations on all forms of writing, and excellent conversation. My name is Nico Chen, and I am the program manager at Mechanics Institute. For those of you who are joining us for the first time here, welcome. Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. Mechanics Institute features a general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and a cinema lit film series. A recent article in the San Francisco Standard describes us as the coolest library in downtown San Francisco and a remote work sanctuary. Come see our historical landmark building for yourself by joining us for a free tour, which happens every Wednesday at noon to 1 p.m. We also have a special evening tour scheduled for Friday, November 17th, starting at 5 p.m. Refreshments will be available during the welcome reception and complimentary beverages will be shared. Please also visit our website, www.milibrary.org, to learn more about our upcoming programs. We also offer a plethora of free events for our Mechanics Institute members, such as our next storytelling showcase on October 25th. Join us for an evening of laughter and storytelling. Local author and host of The Moth, Corey Rosen, will host a dynamic night of storytelling developed in his Your Story Well Told workshops. Come hear stories and jokes being told for the first time with some performers making their stage debut. So once again, this is every last Wednesday and the next one is October 25th and we start this event at 6 p.m. on site at McCannis Institute. To find courses, events and more, remember to go to milibrary.org and click on events on our top menu bar to begin searching and registering for the course or event of your choice. Please also mark your calendars for the Writer's Lunch on Friday, November 17th. Um, the topic for that Writer's Lunch is Food Writing and Telling Heritage Stories Through Food with Viola Butoni, Camper English, and Henry Sue. This event will be moderated by Cheryl J. Bouzet Boutte. Uh, I am going to be dropping the link into the chat in case anyone is interested in, in, uh, in registering for this next Writer's Lunch. Let me go ahead and add that to our chats. And there we go. Um, this month's theme for our Writer's Lunch is the coming of age story. Today, our moderator, Cheryl J. Bizet Boutte will be talking to two moving authors, Dara R. Williams and Daniel Bobka. Isidro Menkos is unable to join us today and she will be joining us sometime in the near future. Award-winning author and Pushcart Prize nominee Cheryl J. Bizet Boutte is an award-winning um, is an award is an Oakland multidisciplinary writer whose autobiographical and fictional short story collections, along with her lyrical and stunning poetry, artfully succeed in getting across deeper meanings about the politics of race and economics without breaking out of the narrative. An inaugural Oakland Poets Laureate runner-up, she is also a popular teacher, literary reader, presenter, storyteller, curator, and MC host for literary and poetry events. We also have Dara R. Williams. She is a long, lifelong Oakland resident whose family was a part of the Great Migration Movement. As a family historian, Dara researches and writes her family story as well as mentors others. Her fiction, nonfiction, and memoir writings have been published in over two dozen publications. She is writing a Great Migration novel, serving tea at Miss Bell's, and has published a preview of her upcoming collection of childhood stories. In My Backyard, Stories of Growing Up in Oakland. As a current Oakland Voices Fellow, she is engaging in media digital storytelling about her beloved city. Dara is a member of Afro Surreal Writers Workshop, Black Girl Writes, and Women Who Submit Organizations. Exploring the relationship between myth and oral and family history, Dara honors the voices of her ancestors. She is also the proud grandmother of two. Last but not least, we also have Daniel Bobka joining us for our conversation today. Daniel grew up in the small town featured in his soon-to-be-released coming-of-age story. 
Lightning Bugs and Aliens. He served in VISTA, the Domestic Peace Corps, attended law school in a, uh, in a theological seminary, worked as a community organizer and managed housing in New York City's toughest neighborhoods before moving to California. His debut novel, Normal Illusions, was described by Kirkus Reviews as a strong start to a new series, accomplished, ambitious crime fiction launching a sensitive, complex hero in a promising array of supporting characters, a multi-layered tale that has shades of California noir a la Chinatown, that 1974 movie starring Jack Nicholson and Faye Dunaway and recognized by uh, the American Film Institution as among the greatest films in American cinema history. Daniel has two grown children and lives in the Northern California foothills, not far from his two granddaughters. We at Mechanics Institute are delighted to bring these three wonderful folks together for a free-flowing free conversation today, which will also include a Q&A with the audience. So please remember to add your questions to the chat, and um, I will read them aloud later on during today's Writer's Lunch. Um, take it away, Cheryl. I will. Thank you, Nico, very, very much. And Daniel and Dara, thank you so much for being here. Um, I think this is going to be a very interesting chat, having uh, two writers writing about coming of age, one from my hometown of Oakland, California, and the other from a small town in Ohio. And I have to say, I have read both of your uh, works, and there are more similarities like I always find than people would imagine. But let's get into the, the conversation. You know, when you write coming of age, and I've done quite a bit of it, in fact, that's how I started out with my writing, um, you can either come from the child point of view or in the child world, or you can do it from the adult world or something in between. Tell me, which do you favor as a writer and why? The child world or the adult world? Well, I, my story is told primarily through the, through the eyes of five 13-year-olds during the summer of 1960. <clears throat> and being as I am the age that I am right now, uh, that's a long time back for me. And so, you know, I, I approach it from the point of view of, of, of as, a, as, a, as someone who is older now, recollecting and remembering the the things in his childhood that meant the most to him. So I chose oh. to pursue it in that that way because, you know, I couldn't quite get into being 13 anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, understood. Dara, how about you? I agree with uh, Daniel somewhat, um, especially with the open stories. I had to take a look at how, um, what was going on from ages uh, four years old to from my memories up until high school. So look through the look through the eyes of the child, tell the story from that point of view, and then at times perhaps bring in the the grown up sensibility. But um, telling the the point of view from the child is works for me in most ways. So, Daryl, when you got ready to sit down and actually craft it, what did you use as the most significant or center point um, for for your story for the, for it to branch out, or did you did you have one? Well, I, I was looking at my neighborhood. Um, so, a friend and I were and I have been talked about this numbers of times. We said we're we're tired of making excuses for having a happy childhood. So I grew up in Oakland and I had a happy childhood. Uh, I was in a neighborhood uh, with black, white, Asian, Latino. Uh, these are people that I knew or families knew each other. And um, so I, I saw things through the eyes of community. There was community at the time. And in doing these stories, I was trying to bring that that remembrance of community. I know times have changed and this is, we're talking, you know, I'm aging myself over 50 years. However, 
Um, I do believe it's important that co uh, community, and I'm, I'm sure there are some neighborhoods in Oakland that um, may have a community, but that was my, my purpose was to show a community in a time uh, when we were just, like I said, we just walked the streets. We walked everywhere. <laughs> we did everything together and we, um, you know, had great times. Not so, that everything so, was perfect, but. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I, I share that with you. We had, uh, you know, we had our Roy Rogers little fake horses and our hats and all of that stuff and our bicycles with the cards and the spokes oh, and the wheel. Yeah. And we mm -hmm. had a great time. How about you, Daniel? What was the, the core that you branched out from or um, was there one? Sure, and, and um, I also was fortunate to have a very happy childhood uh, like, like Dara speaks about with hers. In fact, I was, I was struck by how many, how much alike in so many ways growing up as a 13 year old in Twinsburg, Ohio, was like growing up as an eight year old in Oakland. And uh, that the, the joy that she uh, finds in, you know, in her daily roamings, uh, very much like the joy that, that we found in, in our daily roamings where we just got turned loose in the morning and, you know, our, our mom said, you know, be home for lunch and make sure you're home for dinner when your dad gets home. Otherwise, he's going to get mad and you gotta better have your chores done and so on. So, I mean, so many, just so many, many parallels. Even in what would appear to most people to be two very disparate environments. Not so on that level. Not and, and of course, I grew up in a a small town, which at that time was about 2,500 people, three stop, three stoplights, uh, two lane traffic. Um, seemed like most people knew one another. Uh, and the, com the community, the town was completely integrated. More black kids in my kindergarten school than white kids. Um, no Asian people at all, no Hispanic people at all. Uh, and the town was entirely, though completely integrated and happily so among the kids and lots of people. Um, the, the, town, the town was entirely racially segregated. All the black people lived in one place, Twinsburg Heights. Um, and, um, and certainly growing up as I, as I grew older and I had friends who lived in the Heights and we all went to school together and were active in any one of a number of different things. Um, it, it became more and more, I became more and more aware of the fact that there was this sort of invisible veil around the Heights and how come things were, how come, how come the people in the Heights didn't have, uh, didn't always have indoor bathrooms? How come the people in the Heights didn't always have, uh, uh, running water, but they had to have their own well, and so on. And we ne never, you know, at the time, we're out there riding riding bikes and having fun and experiencing nature and hanging out in trees for a good portion of the day. We just, um, we didn't really notice that. But, you know, but uh, this story is a lot about that town and why that town was the way it was and how that that um what really was structural racism handed down in a very quiet way that that uh people didn't say much about and the kids at that point for the most part didn't really care about because we were we were having happy childhoods so that is uh, the what of it, but, but why did you decide to write it? What made you, what propelled you to write it, Daniel? I felt because I was so fortunate in so many ways to have this kind of like Tom Sawyer childhood uh, 
and uh, and the town gave us that, I felt an obligation. I felt almost a well, I felt a real responsibility to tell the story because I was otherwise I, I felt it would be lost. And, you know, it's a heck of a story. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's a heck of a story. I mean, uh, the town has a crazy, quirky history. Two identical twin brothers journey by horseback to Ohio um, <clears throat> and make a deal. And for twenty dollars, and an agreement to build uh, set aside six acres for a public square, um, fund the school for the uh, merchants and farmers who live there. They get to name the town whatever they want. So they decided they're going to call they're going to call the town Twinsburg, and uh, they go on to marry two twin sisters, hold their property hold their property in common, um, live in the same house, have the same number of children, die of the same disease on the same day, and by their own decree, are buried in the same grave. Now, I have never heard of another town or city with a history like that. And uh, this story happens in and around uh, that graveyard, among other places, where uh, those brothers are buried and uh, the five 13-year-olds uh, in the story hang out, smoke camels or cools or do whatever and talk about the day's business and how they see it. So uh, I, the thought of like this story being lost, just not right. So that's what propelled you. What about you, Dara? I know you said earlier that you're tired of apologizing for having a happy childhood in Oakland. And I am right with you on that. Um, and still having a happy life here, even with the all the bad stuff that's said about the city. What right. what other things propelled you to, to write your stories? Well, if we if we don't tell our stories, it'll be forgotten. And this time the time that I grew up in Oakland will be forgotten because, you know, over the years, I, I hate to use the term gentrification all the time. It's, it's a easy cop out term. However, the city has um, time, th things are gonna change with time. Uh, the city is so different. And a lot of people just don't realize when you talk to people who live in Oakland, who have been here even 20 years, they don't know what Oakland was like in the late 50s and the 60s when I grew up. They did not know that they had certain, that there were certain things going on. And um, the the neighborhoods, um, it, so to me, it's a part of keeping history, keeping history alive for the children and grandchildren so that people will know that Oakland has gone through a lot of changes, gone through a lot of uh, different generations, but people are here with stories and there are, there are a lot of stories to be told. So the, to be clear, my, uh, my book is, it's not, it's a preview. This, this in my backyard, it's, uh, <laughs> and it says st stories of growing up in Oakland, a preview. So this was something I put together because I was going around talking about these stories, but I have uh, a compilation compiling of uh, stories. I, I have about 60, I could have more that I am getting uh, ready for uh, publication. So there's there's so much more. Um, like I say, it goes up to high school from my earliest memory uh, at four years old up to high school. And there are uh, a lot of people that people might know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that brings up my next question. How do you deal with um, or approach writing about family and friends when you're writing these coming, coming of age stories? You know, we had a whole segment on the Writer's Lunch about dealing with that. Um, but inside of these coming of age stories, how do you approach that? 
That's 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 a that's a good question. That's and that's um can be a tough issue to to cope with. So you know, um, I was when I, when I was writing Lightning Bugs and Aliens, um, I had the I, I made a point of talking to uh, the brother of 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 that of one of the characters in the book. And in this case, that character was based on a single person, not the case with respect to anybody else there, but based on a pretty much single person. And um, <clears throat> um, he, um, he, when I discussed the book with him, he said, oh, no, 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 or something like that. So I actually did change my, or my, the development of that character a little bit based on what his brother was reminding me of. And uh, and I felt really good about that because of course I wanted to get the story right. So I did um, spend time talking to, to, uh, to, to some people about it. But I, I tried to be sensitive to that because you know, you're talking about somebody's history and their reputation and sometimes their family. And so in, in my case, you know, it's just like I'm saying, well, this is not based on a single character. This is based on, you know, two or three people and maybe something that evolved from that. Um, so, uh, but it's a delicate, it's a, it can be a delicate issue and you want to feel, and you want to feel really good and comfortable with how you handle it. So. Right. Yeah. And Jira, how about you? How did you approach writing about family and friends and your um, coming of age stories? So fortunately, I, in in respect to the Oakland stories, I don't have, not that negative things didn't happen. Um, I have a story about Ty, uh, Tyrone that was killed on, with his handmade scooter killed on, um, on 23rd Avenue, ran into a bus. Yeah. Uh, but I don't really think that much about, there's a couple of names I've changed, you know, things that happened uh, that were a little negative, but I just really, a lot of it is centered around me and my immediate family. And they know, they all know what I'm doing. They, are, they know um, the different things that happened. Um, I might have to change a couple of teachers' names. I've thought about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> However, but I don't really get too riled up about that. Now, actually, the novel that I'm completing, um, there are more there are more things there that are tough because even though it's a novel, it's loosely based. Um, Serving tea at Miss Bell's is uh, loosely based on the on the four the four there are four women for, for coming from four different southern states. Uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, Texas, and Virginia. And these women are loosely based on the women that my mother knew, a comp, you know, different uh, areas. And so, um, and, and, it's, and all the scenes are fictionalized, but there's a lot of similarities to, you know, women in her sorority. She was, my, and my mother's a teacher and uh, a lot of things that happened. So there's, to me, for me, the novel is more, <laughs> has more real, uh, um, more telling scenes than my life growing up in Oakland. Yeah, okay, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm doing, I'm having the same experience. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, in some of my coming of age stories, I did have to change names because I had some very interesting experiences that, uh, and when you talk about teaching, uh, changing the teacher's name I was going to put the teacher's real name and then I looked her up you know you have to do your research as well right and found out that she was still alive so I said oh I can't use her real name <laughs> right so that being said uh Nico do we have any questions from the audience yet uh, so far, we don't have any questions, but I really highly recommend for our audience members to take that time and put their questions into the um, 
into the chat box. Uh, there is a question that emerged for me. If is is it okay if I ask oh, that yeah. question? Oh yeah, of course. Go ahead. Yeah. So so when I think about coming of age story, I think of that word. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, but it's like Bill Dung's Roman, right? And it's like supposed to be something that you take a lesson away from. Is that some something that you guys do? Like, is there like a lesson that readers should be taking away from your coming of age story? Well, I think that's part that for me, for me, and I, I think I'm sure for everybody else here, you know, part you ask, why did you read this? Why did you write this book? What inspired you to write this story? Well, today can inspire you to write this story because, <laughs> um, because you know, there are things that are of relevance, obviously of deep relevance to what's happening today. And people need to be reminded of that because there are a lot of people walking around outside, maybe even the majority of people walking around outside who basically uh, don't see a lot of things that are staring them straight in the face. And uh, they, you know, they need, let me put it in a very gentle way, they need they need some reminders. They need maybe a little kick and kick in the pants to like recall a little a little more of that morality that they used to recognize just naturally when they were children. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so that and the relevance to you know to wanting to say something which is entirely relevant and entirely topical, uh, that's necessary. You know, if we're gonna move forward in a positive direction, people gotta be doing that. You know, we talk, We were talking earlier before about uh, middle school, that age, and my granddaughter is uh, turning 13. She's in middle school. And I look at her and from that respect, the stories can be told to or te as teachable moments. And I have mentored uh, middle school students in writing their stories with a chapter 510 uh, department make believe. I have worked with student middle, middle grade students and I can see some of their, their struggles, you know, growing up here and, and the different maybe lifestyles they have. And so it's an important time of, so of, of that, of your life and those moments uh, should be captured. And if, if I can do that, if I can tell a story and capture that, that child's angst or joy or trepidation, trepidation, I, I am just, you know, I'm right there to be, to tell the story. And uh, that's what we all, all are doing coming of age at a time when this world is like it is. Yeah. What is going on in the minds of young people in this time in this time? Yeah, I guess my my mission with the coming of age was to always show that we are more the same than we are different. And yes. all so to dispel some of the stereotypes that people have about certain people who live in certain places and look certain ways and to strip all of that away to show that we are all really wanting the same things out of life. So when you get down to that part of it, you have to be fearless in what you write because you can't, if you hold back, you're really not doing the job uh when did you feel that you have come of age that you came of age or do you think you have yet dira oh that's a good question um i would say that my awakening there were there were several factors my coming of age was the year 1968 well, I'll go back to 1963, and um, I was 12 that year, 
And a lot of things happened that summer of 1963. Our family tra traveled back to Arkansas. We, we went, uh, always went back, not, not always, but every two or three years, we traveled back to uh, the home state of Arkansas. And I have a story coming of age in 1963 when my I was confronted with racism, real real racism, when we were traveling through Dallas. And um, so we were accosted and uh, jeered at. We were in our 1963 Buick. We were jeered at, laughed at. And my dad kept say, saying, look straight ahead, don't say a word. And I remember my brother saying, why are they laughing at us? And he said, look straight ahead. And I saw the hurt in my father's eyes. They had not prepared us. They had not prepared us for that because then we had, we, uh, we were looking for a hope. Took us several hours to find somewhere to stay because everything was segregated. So, we usually drove straight through, but at particular time, um, I had gotten car sick, so we had to stop several times. But that in itself, uh, and then that same summer, um, Megger Evers was killed. We know later on in the year, uh, the president was killed. And then 1968, it was another series when I was in high school, 17 in high school, we had the death of Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, and all those things uh, weighed on me. And I and I remember, I I remember becoming angry at that time, angry at the changes that were going on in Oakland. The Black Panthers had party had started, and I found myself angry and and heard a lot of things uh, things were changing and i saw where some of my friendships that i had with other races were were being absolved so yeah that that time of um all of that is is about coming of age about reassessing who you are what's going on what is your next steps Daniel? Well, so, so many of the things which Dara related to are things which obviously were uh, really significant parts of my growing of my growing up and my growing up as a young man and and and, and as a middle-aged man and and so on. So um, it's um I would just echo so much of what she said. The Black Panthers weren't in Twinsburg, Ohio. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but but had they come, they I'm sure they would have been wet, welcomed by a few people. You know. Thank you. Do we have uh, questions <laughs> now from the audience? We sure do. Um, so I wanted to read. Both Sade's question and Patricia's question, because I think they are both interrelated questions. From Sade, she asked, I wanted to know how you navigate writing as teenagers or young children without reverting to the adult voice or trying to solve problems for your protagonists in a mature way. That's from Sade. And Patricia has a question that's quite related. She, she asked, when writing a coming of age memoir, is it more compelling to write it as a story from a child's point of view or looking back as an adult and adding commentary? Dara? So um, most of my stories are from the, uh, the ch child's point of view, but there are stories that do come from a grown-up point of view. So with having so many stories, uh, I was able to do that. And um, it, yeah, it's a very, that's a good question. It's a fine line between taking uh, the adult, taking over, well, this, it should have been this way or it could have been this way, but to, but to you know, make that clear, tell it from the voice of the child first. 
And then if possible, then write another story and this and and decide which is the best way told. It might be told better from a sensibility of an adult looking down at a particular time. It depends on the circumstance. Yes. Daniel? Uh, I think um I think you just have to find what your own comfort level is in in some ways in terms of like in terms of doing that because you you can't say oh it's only going to be the, the the voice of that uh, 10 year old um that uh, uh, um i don't know that you can say that before you before you start writing the story before you craft the story and in the process of doing that then you're going to uh, find that uh, spot where it's um, a, a sort of the merging of the two and you may feel like well I can't really give this I can't infuse this story um, unless I have this more mature voice perhaps to add to it or unless I have this more youthful voice to 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 add to it. And and I and I'll even chime in on this one um because I have found that I just strictly write from the perspective that my memory and my muse tell me to. And and that goes to Daniel's comfort comfort statement. I have some coming of age stories that I have written completely from the, my child's perspective at the age I was when they occurred. Uh, one of my wow. first stories wow. was um, Dead weird. Chickens and Miss Ann, which is a story about my going to Texas when I was five years old, um, which was really a coming of age um, knockout punch for me coming from California to Texas and all of that meant in the, all that that meant in the 1950s. Um, and my perspective in that story is totally from, the, from that five-year-old perspective, even to the language and the way I um, phrased things and, and how I saw them from a child's, child's view. And then in other stories where I am remembering things and going back and not having that much clarity I write it from the memory of an, of the adult that I, I was at the time I wrote the story or the teenager I was at the time. So it really is about how you feel you are going to be able to give the most clarity and meaning and worth to your story when you write it. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. Yes, me, me as well. Yeah. Well, Any other questions out there from the audience? Of course. Um, we have one more question from Sade, and she asks, how do you cover a passage of time for a coming-of-age story without the book becoming too bulky, for instance, um, growing up through high school? Dara? Well, mine are... Uh stories, they're stories and big nets and, and anecdotes. So I take the time with each one. Uh, some of the stories are two or three pages. I have some that are six or seven pages. So I take, I try to take the time needed to tell the story at the time uh, that it happened or what, depending on what happened. And um, yeah, that's the only way that I could I could do it is not not to uh, stifle it or to make it uh, uh, cumbersome, but to tell the story as best I could with the how long it needs to be. Yeah. And then you know, there's always editing, right? Which is just yeah. the real game in writing. Right. Um, Daniel. Uh, you 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 all you all hit it on the head a number of times consistently. Um, yeah, it's you know I it, you the story is going to take 
however long the story takes. Um, so, um, you know, I wrote a novel that was 400 pages long, and that's how long it took to tell the story. And, uh, and, uh, and there were a lot of characters and, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things happening, did, perhaps more, certainly more so than in a convention, you know, coming of age story, because that's like a mystery, mystery romance. But, you know, it's just going to take what it's going to take. You, you can't let it, you can't make it be long just because you want it to be long, longer. You know? okay. <laughs> that, yeah, and you, and you, you know, that's what, like I you, said, editing is about, you, you will find that you will say a lot of things that really don't add necessarily to your story mm -hmm. when you are writing you need to you need to write with the thought in in the back of your head that you have a message you're trying to get across there's something you're trying to say mm -hmm. and if it takes you 400 pages to say it it takes you 400 pages if you can do a flash fiction piece or a short story then that works too when you I always tell writers when you have written something and you read it and you sit back and smile, you're all right. You've done it. Mm -hmm. I see this. Patricia has a question. She does. Um, and I would also oh, recommend for people to add your questions to the chat box. Patricia's question is, can you write a coming of age story and call it memoir when you're making up a lot of the details and dialogue? Well, uh, let me let me let me say ahead. this first, uh, uh, and then we'll go to uh, Dara and Daniel. I <laughs> I always tell people in my writing classes: the minute that you start trying to remember dialogue, you're already writing fiction, unless you've taped it somewhere and you have it written down verbatim. You're already mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Dara, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, I I'm thankful mm -hmm. that I still have good memory, but. Uh, but you do have to ad lib here or there because you at the time that things happen and I have a story that was that something happened to my brother in, in the junior high and the uh, so he came home and told us about it and was important to it was very important that it went in in the you know my collection so of course the the way he told it you know and then it's third hand by the time it gets to me <laughs> so but i have the basic details i have uh the people and we know what happened we know what the issue was and so uh that i think in memoir as you say unless you have been unless you were omnipresent all the time you don't know exactly everything that was said and done you have to uh, take make the story believable, of course, but you don't have every every detail. Daniel, I think that the two of you are so are so eloquently have such an eloquent perspective. I mean, you're really it's it's a it's a it's 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 good to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. It's good to meet. It's good to meet the two of you. It's good to hear you. It's good to hear you. So, um, yeah, I just you. It's, um, I, I couldn't say it any more clearly than you already did. It's so, so, so well put. Um, one thing I did want to mention that I was, uh, changing the subject for a moment. Um, uh, Dara, I really, if you haven't read Dara's stuff, you got to read it. <laughs> if, you, if you haven't read Cheryl's work, wow. Um, so thank you both. Well, thank you. We say thank the same to you. Thank you. I'm looking that's forward to reading, reading your, your book. Um, that sounds fascinating in Ohio really interested I want and, to ask you know, we what, had you had yeah. that incident about no I'm sorry you had that incident I just wanted to mention since you were talking about Oakland and we're talking about 
similarities and things like that. And, and uh, the element of like, whoa, with you have a happy childhood and, and something, something perhaps horrible happens or something completely unexpected happens. And, and, uh, and you, in, 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 in your description, Adara, we're talking about Tyrone and how Tyrone met his end. And, um, and uh, in this, in my story, well, there's somebody who meets their end and uh, a bit. And, um, you know, that, 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 uh, that, uh, that element of danger, that element of like um, realizing that you're not uh, omnipotent or that you uh, are not going to live forever, you know, but you have somebody who like suddenly dies. For me, rather than Tyrone, it was a, it was a black kid who was a halfback on the high school football team. And just suddenly he wasn't there anymore because he was killed in an automobile accident. So, you know, um, that that's an inch. I sort of forgot a bit about that and was reminded of it when I was reading uh, when I was reading another another book um, that oftentimes there is that. That concern with with a certain amount of danger that you weren't aware of before, that's very much um something that's talked about in lightning bugs and aliens because that that's a uh, duck and cover and, and and all that sort of thing so um it's just um you know it's it's so many common so many commonalities so many uh parallel movements almost in the same same direction and 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 kids having it from a writing point of view, but you know, with the world as a whole, uh, man, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. You know, look at look at how kids spend all their time now, uh, uh, justifiably so, incredibly so, tuning into climate change and the catastrophic consequences of that. And and uh, um, you know, back then it was like, hey, there's an atom bomb out there. Well, nobody ever said a thing about it, right? Or what that could do. That's a heck of a, that's a heck of a load to really drop on kids. And now there's some heavy loads being dropped on kids that shouldn't be dropped. So I think, you know, that's what we're all talking about too. We're talking about the relevance between these things and, and, uh, um, the way that they're that they're connected and the way that we are all connected. Yes, yes. Uh, I want to I want to revisit Patricia's last question for a moment, and also acknowledge that I see she has another. Um, when we talk about uh, using dialogue in coming of age stories and memoirs, uh, it, it's it can be a slippery slope to to do that. Uh, and not move into the fiction realm. So what I have done in, in my coming of age stories is there were memories and events that were so strongly felt for me and things that were said by adults in my life that I remember exactly what they said. Mm -hmm. And I can use that dialogue. And when I get to the point of not being able to remember what was said, but I remember what happened, then I go into the narrative phase. So that's just a, a, a trick for you to, to know. If you can remember exactly what somebody said or pretty close to it, um, then inside of the coming of age story, uh, which is a true story for you, you can use the dialogue. If, if you can't, you can only remember what happened. Use the narrative form and mix them up. And, mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to, to write your story with meaning and, and passion and, and interest for, for your readers. Now I also see, uh, Patricia, you had another, Patricia had another question. Sure. Um, and Cheryl, I, I just wanted to extend the conversation about dialogue a little bit because a, a question emerged, which is, you know, when I think back on dialogue, 
it's not it's not an English for me. You know, I grew up in a Chinese speaking family. And so like when it comes to a multilingual experience and you're writing primarily in English, how do you um, honor that dialogue in a way that gives voice to the people around you who might speak differently? Well, you know what I've done? Um, I have written works where, well, my father spoke French up until the time he was 15, that his family did not speak English. So I have some passages where I have used both French dialogue and then I did the translation. So I honored it that way. But also uh, I honored it by um, making sure that I knew what was actually said if I was going to write it in English and not change anything. And then in some cases, I, well, very few, I couldn't quite translate it. It just didn't have the same meaning. And so I did the narrative description of what was happening. Uh, Dara, uh, Daniel, you have any comments on that? I, I have very little experience uh, with that, but I think uh, I like what you just said um, as an example. Um, I mean, I had, there were uh, different phrases, of course, Spanish, and I had friends who, uh, we had family friends who uh, were Creole, and there were different um the biggest joke was that they they only knew, my friends only knew the curse words because right exactly they, learn those first <laughs> learn the curse words so yeah yeah Daniel no I mean uh, I I I'm blown away by the fact that you said. That you that you could remember things when and were writing when you were five years old. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. That's I amazing. Have, <laughs> I have a little scratch stuff. Yeah. You should be a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in 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 terms of your uh, just one more thing on your question, uh, Nico. Um, I actually have uh, relatives and just back to the French thing, I have relatives in France. So when I re would remember some of the things my grandfather would say and I couldn't really translate them, I asked my relatives to help me. So, you know, don't ever be afraid to ask for help. And that, and that brings up another question for me. Um, different people have different memories. <laughs> Of the same thing. Of the same thing, yes. Siblings. How do you yeah. all deal with that? Yeah, siblings, you, you brought up in the same family, same household, tr the same way, but two, but siblings will remember things differently. Um, my brother and I remember a certain things differently. He and my sister remember things differently. So yeah, it's, yeah, it can be, it can, it, it's that way. <laughs> it's, hey, what about you, Daniel? You have that, that issue? Uh, I'm, 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 I would just echo what, what Dara was saying, really. Yeah. Nico, did Patricia have another question? He sure did. And I just wanted to be mindful of our time. We do have five minutes left. So let's keep this one a little more concise, if possible. How do you make your main character multidimensional and relatable? Well, Daniel? No, nobody nobody oh, is, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, go, go ahead, ahead Dara. Go ahead, Dara. No, go ahead. Uh, nobody is one way. Uh, you're not all good. You're not all bad. Um, you just, when, if you're going to draw, draw a particular character, you should sit down and decide what their, uh, good characters are and what their flaws are and, um, and weave them, weave them together because as I say, you're not one thing. No, nobody is all one thing. That's right. And if you don't want to write the bad stuff, leave it out. 
<laughs> and if you do, change the names. <laughs> good advice. Daniel. Daniel? Uh good advice. Ask ask me that ask me to ask me that a little more a little more uh uh precisely. So what was the question again? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, so from Patricia, how do you make your main character multidimensional and relatable? Well, it got to be multidimensional. If it was if the character I guess wasn't multidimensional, he or she would probably might wind up being pretty much on the dull side. Uh so you 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 got to make characters and you got to make characters relatable because well this is this is about you know you you got to make life real on the pages and you know you got to you got to you got to be there you know i got a good friend who's uh not doing so well right now and he signs off all his emails with something that says um um in order to have in order to write about life you have to have lived it ernest hemingway and he puts that on the bottom yeah. of all his emails um so you know you got it's good you got to make it real you got to make it real you got to make it authentic you got to make it genuine and if it isn't it isn't and and that's where editing comes in and hopefully you don't drive yourself insane in the process of editing yeah and always remember this writers you are the writer you are in control of what you write so you get to choose and you get to be the one that's happy about your product at the end. When you put it out there into the world, you'll be surprised. You will connect with someone. Anyone else? Any last comments, mm -hmm. Daniel, Dira? Pleasure to be here, really enjoyed getting to spend time with y'all and um, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for being here. Uh, likewise, it has been a pleasure to, when you talk things out, you see it clearly and, and you help yourself in your right, takeaway tips uh, from both Daniel and Cheryl, uh, taking some of what they say that it helps you become a better writer, better, a better storyteller. So thank, thank you all for the good advice. <laughs> thank you both so much. I learned something every time I do one of these lunches and I've learned a lot today. I Back to you, Nico. Yeah, I, I deeply appreciate the beautiful conversation that y'all had today. I added also the websites of our special guests into the chat box in case you are interested in seeing their works um, on, uh, on the interwebs. Um, also, please remember that we do have a writer's lunch next month as well on November 17th. Uh, the theme is on food writing and telling heritage stories through food. So I'm also going to be adding the link here again in our chat box. Many blessings to all of you for being here with us today. Thank you, Dara. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Cheryl, for your amazing presence. And we will be um, also um, uploading this video uh, on our YouTube channel. So in case you want to go back to um, something that you said, but you couldn't quite manage to write down, I wrote down like 1239 uh, to, to look back to that time when I heard something amazing and I wanted to write it write it down, but I cannot quite get to it. Um, you can go ahead and visit our YouTube channel to look at this video again. Have an amazing day and I'll see y'all um, next month for Writer's Lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, Alyssa. Oh. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, take care, everyone. Bye.